and you're very welcome to this Thought Leader interview brought to you by the Innovation Value Institute, which is based at Maynooth University. My name is Claire O'Connell, and it's my pleasure to be joined by Mark Crosby. Mark, you are Vice President and Data Protection Officer at Dropbox. And thanks so much for inviting us into the Dropbox office in Dublin, these beautiful surroundings. I think it's still lovely to be able to meet face to face now after yeah. COVID, isn't it? It's, it is definitely, yeah. It can sometimes be a rarity. Um, so as the Data Protection Officer, you are the Senior Executive with responsibility for overseeing data privacy mm -hmm. at Dropbox. And of course, Dropbox is a great example of a company that needs to pay a lot of attention mm -hmm. to data privacy as part of data governance because you're responsible for keeping customers' information safe as they share it, as they store it in mm -hmm. the cloud, which is very important. Um, now, of course, data privacy is not a, a new thing, mm -hmm. but what's new is the digital technology now on which we are all sharing data, storing data, potentially leaking data if we're mm -hmm. not careful. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about how you came to be in this role and along your career, the changes that you've seen yeah. in data privacy along the way? Yeah, thanks, Claire. And you're very welcome to Dropbox. It's actually great to have you here. And it's great, as you said, to meet in person is lovely. I mean, I've been in the technology space for over 25 years now, um, starting back in the 90s before the first dot-com bubble. So I've, I've seen a lot of ups and downs over those years. And I've certainly seen how the space of technology has changed as we've moved into the cloud, as we've become more distributed, and then ultimately as mobiles exploded, giving you instant access to information everywhere at any point in time. And I think what's interesting is this, this kind of explosion in information and this almost overloading of what's out there has made both uh, pro the promise come true of like you can touch your fingers on any piece of information, but at the same time, it's almost impossible to find the right thing or you're struggling to put two and two together to figure out the full story on things. And I think what we're seeing now is people want more and more tools to help them organize and make sense of the huge amount of information they have access to, be it in their personal lives or be it in the workplace. And certainly companies are struggling with this as they have employees around the world who are highly distributed. Very, very challenging environment to manage information. And I think what I've seen is a trend over time towards more and more use of technology to kind of augment and accelerate the humans in the loop, if you will, or people in the workplace, people in their personal lives, uh, versus sort of replacing them, if you will. So it's about making us smarter and better at what we do. Um, my background uh, was in computer security. When I first started work uh, many, many years ago, I was very much focused on security systems. And even back then, security was seen as a somewhat esoteric sort of sideline activity uh, you know, very much under the radar, not something that was at the core of what any company was talking about at the time. But over the years, that changed, obviously. And it didn't take much for it to change. Some big headlines, a few big news stories, and all of a sudden, security became a board-level issue. The boards of companies were worried about it. Liability was a real issue. Shareholders were asking questions. And I think this led to the first kind of big sea change I, sh I saw in my career, which was the shift away from seeing problems like security or privacy as technology only solutions required, but as requiring a full holistic solution in either a company from like the board level on down, or at a national or international level with good regulation like we see with the GDPR and hopefully soon with the AI Act. And so I got into the privacy space about six years ago when GDPR came into force. And I felt I was a bit of a fish out of water, to be honest, because as a person with a technical background and a security background, I was surrounded by lawyers and regulators and policymakers. But it actually proved to be a very good mix and match because I understood fundamentally how the technology worked at the bottom, having built a lot of the code myself. And so I could kind of marry that to the legal side and the regulatory side to kind of navigate my way through it. And so since then, it's, it's really only accelerated. I've just seen it getting faster and faster with more and more awareness, both in the general public and on the side of regulators and policymakers around both the benefits of, of the explosion of technology we've had and the risks as well. You mentioned GDPR there, which is, I think, six years old. Mm -hmm. It's six years since it came into, uh, into effect. Um, and that, that really changed the landscape hugely. So 
today, what is your role as a data protection officer? What, what do you do? Yeah, so the GDPR, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, was a, a landmark piece of legislation that the EU passed in 2018 and came into force, which required companies to really step up and take accountability for the data that they were storing and processing on behalf of people. And one of the interesting features of the GDPR was it didn't really care what the technology was. It was a technology neutral piece of legislation. Um, and it's unusual to find that because most legislation is written or regulations are written with a particular thing in mind. The other interesting thing about the GDPR, and this really surprised a lot of people, certainly outside of Europe, was its reach extended globally. It didn't matter if you were a company in Australia or Japan or the US, if you were processing data for European citizens, the GDPR applied to you. And this extraterritorial reach, this long arm that it had, has kind of influenced how a lot of countries have since approached drafting regulation. And indeed, the GDPR is now seen as sort of the, the gold standard that a lot of other countries that have drafted their own privacy laws take it, they adapt it somewhat to their own um, regimes, but ultimately it, the, the principles that it embodies are what most laws around the world are based on now. So what my role involves is making sure that Dropbox meets our obligations under the GDPR and doing it in such a way that we're putting the, the rights and the privacy rights of our users first and foremost in how we make our decisions. And doing that in a way that's scalable, because obviously with hundreds of millions of users, we've got to do things in a way that's scalable, that's sensible, that can be explained and is transparent to people. Like people know you're processing your, their data, they're asking you to, but they just want to know what you're doing with it, how you're storing it, how are you processing it, and what control they have over that. People want to feel in control, and when they don't feel in control, when they're worried about something being done that they don't understand, that's when they get nervous. So my role is to very much oversee all of that in any decision we're making, to report up to our board about those things if I see risks, and to engage with, with the regulators around the world, mainly the Irish Data Protection Commission, uh, we, you know, meeting them frequently and in discussions with them, so that they can ask us questions or raise concerns if they have any, and we can keep them up to date on the latest in technology. That sounds to me like it's quite a high level that you're working at. You're talking about international and regulation, etc. Do you also have to keep an ear to the ground, sort of, you know, what's happening on the ground with people? How do you do that? Yeah, that is like the biggest challenge of a role of a DPO, certainly in any medium to large size company, is just keeping on top of everything. Because on the one hand, you're reading about negotiations between European nations around the AI Act and you're up in the cloud somewhere. And the next moment you're dealing with the, hey Mark, we have this project, what should we do about X, Y, and Z? And you're down into the nitty gritty details. And so being able to flex up and down like that, I think is the hallmark of a, of a good effective DPO in my mind. Somebody who's okay at kind of talking at a macro level about risks and understanding the bigger landscape, but then bringing that back down to the nuts and bolts, explaining it to the engineers, explaining it to the product designers, explaining it to the board, what they need to be doing and worrying about, and making it um, actionable, making it real for them. And I think a large challenge I see a lot of DPOs have, and I speak to many DPOs, and we all struggle with this at times, is just communicating all of these details in a way that whether it's an engineer you're talking to, a product designer, or an executive making a business decision, that they can make a good decision. You just want them to make a good decision, and you want your advice to be good and useful and to drive real change. And so just getting the level right is the big challenge. So you don't get lost in the weeds, and you're not up airy-fairy in the cloud somewhere, if you will. And at the end of all that, what does good data protection, good data privacy look like to you? That's, that's one of those things that's almost a moving target. And it sounds like a cop-out answer, but in reality, I think as time goes on, uh, people, our users, anyone in the world, we're becoming more and more aware of their rights, their privacy rights, but also the risks, as well as the benefits of all the technology that's out there. And I think people are more aware now than I've ever seen before of what their rights are under GDPR, and they're not afraid to try and use them. They understand that they're allowed to use these rights which I think is a good thing because it holds everybody accountable and it forces companies to, to really sit down and consider 
hang on a second, are we thinking about our users here? Are we putting them at the heart of the decision? Are we doing right by them? And I think uh, one of the, the things that I see is that if you, if you switch your perspective and you put the user at the heart of your decision making, think of your, your customers, your users, how are they going to react to this? What are they going to think when they see this? Will they feel in control? Will they feel comfortable? Will they feel like they understand what's happening? If you can go and solve that and give those answers to people in a way that they can access and understand without legal mumbo jumbo around it, you've gone an awful long way towards actually doing the right thing to meet your obligations. So that's kind of the way I approach thinking about those type of problems. And in terms of users, not every user is different, but um, broadly speaking, do you see differences in the demographics, maybe between the teenagers and the early people in early adulthood versus maybe the customers who've been around a little longer? Yeah, there's certainly uh, differences, both geographical and I wouldn't, I wouldn't know demographics so much, but certainly from a geographical point of view and also from a stage in you know, their career point of view, um, a lot of con companies are more established or more conservative companies may be very reluctant or hesitant to explore using the cloud or putting their data in the cloud thinking well if I can see it here in front of me I know it's safe though that isn't true because computers get hacked no matter whether they're under your desk or in a data center somewhere they're going to get hacked and so where has the better chance of protecting it I think people certainly of the younger generation and if you're looking at people early in their career who would be using Dropbox, they're starting out, they're entrepreneurs, they've just started a business, um, they're much more willing to adapt and use technology to solve a problem. Because for them, technology is just one more tool, and the cloud is just one more tool they have available to them. They understand that they're able to you know, put some data out there, but they also understand the, the commitments we're making to them to keep that data safe, for example. So I think, you definitely see uh, younger people, people who are uh, like just starting out in their careers, being far more open to using different technologies, cloud technology or even AI technology, for example, to kind of get their business going or you know, work for their clients. And we're obviously generalizing hugely there, but it's interesting mm. to think about those, those broad trends. In terms of, we can't have a conversation about data privacy without mentioning AI. Uh, yes. So how has the advent of maybe the large language models, the chat GPT and the like, how has that changed the landscape? I think for me, what's very interesting is how AI has been around for decades. Right? The concept of it is, is not new. But it really wasn't until chat GPT exploded into the public consciousness that everybody had suddenly made this pivot to AI. And in some sense, there's an awful lot of froth out there and wild promises. But at its heart, I think AI is definitely going to be, there's no two ways about it, the way we're looking at it, transformative. To me, it feels like it's an augmented or co-pilot style experience for, for whether you're working or leading your personal life. There's, there's a range of extremes of opinion out there, obviously, around AI. Everything from it's just a flash in the pan to it's going to replace all of us and come and take our jobs. As usual, the, the reality will land somewhere in the middle. And it'll probably be a case where the, the AI tools we build will make everyday things easier. It will augment our experiences in a lot of ways. It will superpower us in some workplace scenarios or personal scenarios. Um, I've used ChatGPT to write Christmas card rhymes and silly songs for people. And it's a great example. Yes, it's a trivial example, but like, you know, that was the first thing I thought of. I was like, if I don't want to write a poem, I'll get ChatGPT to do it for me, for example. On the same time, we have to, be, we have to acknowledge there's risks, right? Every new technology comes with risks. But how we approach thinking about those and how we approach, like, marrying the, the promise of AI innovation with, at the same time, the requirements of privacy and good data governance is going to be key to getting the balance right so that we don't stifle the new technology too soon or uh, at the same time go too wild and, and let it grow with any good oversight. Is part of that incorporating good principles around AI and data governance early in the design of this technology? Absolutely. Whether it's AI or any new technology, getting in early and thinking about privacy principles, uh, privacy by design as it's called, is, is critical. Otherwise, you're going to find yourself redoing an awful lot of the work later on because 
you may make decisions around how you store and process data or how you're using it and you may find those in opposition with what you're required to do under various legislation such as the GDPR. And if you can stop and think about that early and build processes as you're developing products such that that privacy uh, considerations come in right at the beginning of the program versus at the very end, you're going to have a far smoother time through the development cycle and at the same time it'll be very obvious to people who sit down and use your service or your product that you've designed it with privacy at the heart of what you were setting out to do. And I think people are going to respect that and that can become a competitive differentiator if it's done right. So you think that people are going to start look more and more at the provenance and the trustability of Absolutely. technology before they decide to subscribe or, or commit to using it? Absolutely. And, and as the old saying goes, you, 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 know, you take years to build a reputation, but you can lose it in a split second through a poor decision. And so like Dropbox, you know, as a brand, we've been in business for many years. We've got this trusted brand that people trust us with their content and their files. And at the same time, that's a very, very important you know, burden for us to carry and keep at the heart of what we, we think and how we act for our users. And I think you know, when companies approach things from a fast and loose point of view, I think in the end, you only get burnt because users are far too clever now to be fooled for long and regulators are well attuned to what technology can and can't do. So you, you won't get away with that for long. So companies that set out to build a brand around trust and to earn and maintain that trust over the long term will do much better. So how do you see regulation coming in here almost like sort of a, a blanket over both kind of you know the, the customers and the organizations around data? What are you seeing in terms of, of the speed of regulation? Is it moving fast enough? Well we talked a bit about like you know how have I seen changes over my career when we first sat down and I have to say I have not seen uh, the speed at which we've seen regulation and change as I've seen over the last year. This has perhaps been some of the fastest kind of iteration from a regulatory point of view. Um, in general, regulation moves slow. You know, go governments, regulators, they, they don't move at the same speed as technology. But now we're almost seeing them moving in lockstep together. We see, for example, in the US, the executive order from the White House. We have the AI, AI Act here. We have the G7 principles and the OECD principles. And so these things are all coming out, which shows there's a singular focus on this new technology like I've never seen. But there's also a willingness to do something and to be seen to do something. Now, that can lead to knee-jerk reactions. But in general, what we're seeing is regulations which are designed to try and balance the need for innovation, an exchange of data between you know, allied parties and like, um, like geographies and like regions, but at the same time balance that with the lessons learned from the early years of GDPR and the lessons learned from those regulations, not to make it too loose or too easy to bypass. And so they're trying to find this balancing point, and I think it's really, really interesting to see the speed at which they're moving at the moment. One of the things that has made GDPR so long lasting, I suppose, and the fact that it can still work six years later, which in, in technology terms is, is quite a, a long period, mm -hmm. um, is that it wasn't too focused on the specific technologies. Is there a danger maybe of the regulations focusing too much on the technology we have today, not thinking too much about that broader picture of tomorrow? I mean, th certainly when you think about how technology has changed over the lifetime of the GDPR, that six years, it's, it's, we, we only have just been talking about AI and how many other things have shifted and changes o over that time. Um, I, would, I would always hope that the technology regulation that we come out with will be future-proofed and will be able to scale. Uh, ultimately, we have to wait and see what the final texts are for the AI Act and we'll be able to tease that out. And of course, then see how that's actually implemented in practice by the regulators in the various uh, nation states and countries around Europe, for example. Um, because ultimately it's down to them to, as to how they choose to, to enforce the regulation. And so that really will be the space to watch now over the coming years. So Mark, obviously data protection, data privacy is becoming ever more important for organizations big and small. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose and an, an a large company, a large technology company probably has the resources to really do this well, do this really properly. What about the smaller organizations? What about the SMEs, the 
sort of the, the self-employed even mm -hmm. individuals who maybe don't have a huge amount of bandwidth to be looking after privacy but it is something they still need to do what should they do uh, well it's certainly a challenge when you're a smaller business because after all your your focus on is on running the business you, you your job is not to worry about privacy all day every day and so it comes down to some very basic simple things that you can do and there are some guides and resources out there for the SME sector specifically and I would encourage people to go look at the Irish Data Protection Commission website, uh, dataprotection.ie. And there are other guides out there as well, published by, by other regulators. But they have a very straightforward, accessible guide for the basic steps you need to take, whether you're a small business, a medium sized or even a huge business. But it can really help just break down and demystify the whole thing. One of the key things is know your data. What data are you storing for people? Where are you storing it? Why are you storing it and how are you processing it? What are you doing with it? Just being able to explain that in simple plain English. You don't need to have any legal mumbo jumbo around it, just simple plain English. If you can explain that and explain it clearly to people, then you've gone a long way towards understanding your data. Being transparent. Being transparent in your, in your policies or how you're going about your business, why you're using certain companies to do different processing, like whether it's inventory, whether it's payroll, whether it's delivery of a, a final product to a client, why are you using it? So transparency around that. And control. Put your, your customers, put your users, and don't forget your employees, because they're also data subjects too, put them in control of their data. Do they have access? Can they make requests? If you did get a request, how would you get it? What would you do about it? Just think about that and have that somewhat figured out so that when it does happen, you're not suddenly caught on the hop and unaware of what to do. So that's what it is. Know your data, transparency, and control. And you think of it from those three points of view. If you're a small company, obviously you've got a um, smaller amount of data potentially and a smaller number of systems versus a medium to larger company. But those are the basic principles that apply to everybody. Should everyone have a data protection and privacy policy from, as I say, self-employed through SMEs right up to larger organizations? Ideally, it would force you to sit down and think about what it is you're doing and why. Because, you know, the exercise of writing those policies, and you don't have to start from scratch. There are templates out there that, that will help you get started. But that exercise is really, really good at just making you sit down and think for a second and go, huh, why am I doing that? Why am I storing it? How long should I store that data for? Do I really need to keep it for that long? And even that exercise alone is good for you as a business owner to sit down and think about your business and, and what it's doing with data, which is now the, both the lifeblood of business, but also something that people are so well aware of because it's, they, they understand the value of data these days. Um, you don't need to have a big complicated legal section. There's plenty of ways to go about doing that without having to put it together. And there are certain exclusions for particular types of businesses and processing. They're all detailed on the Data Protection Commission website I mentioned earlier. So Mark, Mark Crosby, Vice President and Data Protection Officer with Dropbox, thank you so much for joining us today. And if you would like to find out more about the Thought Leaders series with the Innovation Value Institute, please do check out the show notes. I'm Claire O'Connell. Thank you so much for joining us.